Hello and welcome to Furious Tea Break and another episode of Junk in the Trunk. Now, just quickly, in case you've only clicked on this thumbnail because you recognise me, uh, but didn't realise you'd moved on to a different channel by mistake, this is Furious Tea Break. It's not the main channel for your driving because there's uh, random things that don't quite fit in with the main channel, and in particular, Junk in the Trunk, which is where I started it. Um, lots of people love Junk in the Trunk, and I guess that's why you're watching it, because you're one of those. A lot of people really didn't like it, and they actually unsubscribed whenever they saw an episode of it. So doing a video which a lot of people liked managed to lose a lot of viewers so I decided to stick on a second channel where we can do other stuff that's not main channel content including this so if you haven't already hit subscribe to Furious Tea Break then please do hit the subscribe button down there because it's different to Furious Driving now we're all good. Now we haven't done a junk in the trunk for a few weeks. There's been a slightly slow summer time of stuff arriving in the post bag and I don't want to do one that was too little. And the other thing which I need to say is we still haven't got the trunk back. The trunk is still attached to the Rover P6 V8 which is still somewhere else having the engine not fixed. So um, we're still using the Mercedes W123 so this is still treats from the seats because we're going to use the cabin of the W123 to reach in. Unfortunately it's silent and you can't see it as opposed to the lovely creek which we all but grown accustomed to on the Rover P6. Anyway, so without further ado, let's go and dive into the seats for the treats and see what's arrived in the post bag. Now, now first of all, he says reappearing, this mini bag, this mini sports bag was handed to me by the wonderful Retro Matt from off of Twitter, uh, who saw me up at the Festival of the Unexceptional and incidentally he was instrumental in organising the amazing mini trip which I've just been on last weekend in the Wire Edge Mini over to the Isle of Wight as part of West Country Minis. Um, so yeah thanks man, that was brilliant, I really enjoyed going over there. He, sent, he handed me, I should say, a whole bunch of mini stuff. Um, not full mini spot, I'm not sure. First of all we've got a couple of Haynes manuals, you can never have too many Haynes manuals. First of all there was a Punto one which is not a mini, it, but as you may have seen on the main channel, I now own the oldest Punto in Britain, uh, a really, really, really early Elridge one, which was registered before they went on sale. And having bought it from the guy who pretty much runs the Fiat Club in the country, he knows these things. Also, we have got a genuine mini uh, Haynes manual for the 1959 to 1975. Turns out I did have one of these over in the barn in the car, but it's really handy to have two of them because it means I can have one in the barn and one over here. So one for referencing stuff when I'm thinking about it, one over there when I'm doing it. So that's also handy, but also there's still stuff in the bag. This is a genuine mini sport bits and pieces. So just random stuff that he's uh, repaired a number of minis on and had some leftovers. So we. I've got all kinds of useful things which will definitely come in handy because, um, well, I need lots of mini stuff in the near future. I'll empty it all out and then I'll run it through because I, I don't even know what's in here myself. <laughs> First of all, well, these appear to be, oh, there's there four of these, and there are four. Oh, I thought they were said I Heart Minis, little wooden cutouts. That's quite cute. Let's turn that right around for you. I Heart Minis. Another I Heart Minis. Made a little bit of wood. These, I don't know where these would have come from. And I, I hot cider as well, apparently, which is true. I do quite like cider. <laughs> I'm from Kent. It's the apple growing county of the world. So cider and, and beer, apples and hops. Right, I'll say this is really handy. We're getting into the actual bits of mini. This is the behind the grill replacement connections. Now, if you saw me stripping the 1969 Mini, the Morris, in the last video or so. I had to cut off a lot of those connections, so those connections will be very handy indeed. Interior switch, I've no idea what works and what doesn't on the interior of that car because it's not been on the road since the 1990s, so that will probably come in handy. Uh, rocker cover spacers and rubbers. Well, I did actually pick up a new rocker cover gasket for it. Um, when I was over in the Isle of Wight because there were two pounds on the mini sport stand. Also picked up a new radiator for it as well because that was discounted quite heavily as well. And I'm sure I'll need a new one of them. This is guaranteed parts, but I don't know what it is in a little box. This is, let's have a look, oh, a thermostat. I assume minis all run at the same temperature. I will double check that. So that's kind of handy to have. And this is, Oh, water pump fitting kit. I'm sure I'll be needing a new water pump on that engine before it goes back in the car. Again, having been sat for close to 30 years, um, yeah, the water pump's probably due for a change. And finally, uh, it's a speedo drive. That speedo cable. Um, 
for a mini center speedo. But I don't know if that's gonna be the same on an auto as a manual because my mine weirdly is automatic, which is a very unusual thing to find, especially in a Mark II. So I don't know. Thank you, Matt. I really appreciate all of that. That's really, really handy stuff, which is definitely gonna come in handy. I'm, I'm collecting parts faster than I'm taking them off at the moment. The car's almost down to a bare shell. It just needs the doors to come off and a bit of the uh, hydro, well, let's get hydro elastic and the other version of hydro mixed up depending on the year. But anyway, the hydro cut pipes need to come off and it's basically ready to go off and be blasted. Right, this one has come from somewhere within the UK, judging by the postage. In case you've not got the address, it's Furious Driving, Junk in the Trunk, PO Box 477, Aylesford, Kent, ME69, LE. Better keep that in mind. If you've got stuff to send, share with the class, give us all a laugh. Now we have got here, ooh, oh, long letter actually. Oh, brochures, I like brochures. Okay, so it says, Dear Matt, I hope this letter finds you all well. I wanted to send you some items for junk in the trunk um, to add to your collection. I thought you may find these interesting. I think I will, as I do like brochures quite a lot. So these are some favorite car items um, of, well, the Renault 16, the first proper hatchback. So quite a long letter here from, from Dan, Daniel Russell. Thank you much indeed, Daniel. Who actually, bizarrely, after the Punto book just arriving, mentions the Punto being his favorite. So we've got some interesting cars here. So first of all, and I, Wow, these really are unusual. We've got the Vauxhall Victor. Now this is a curiosity. We've got two Nissan Prairie brochures. Oops. And a Renault 16. Well, let's have a quick look through these because you know and I know brochures are brilliant. So this is a 19, what year is this? 1975 Renault 16, the first kind of proper hatchback. And on the back of it, we've actually got the full Renault range to admire and enjoy. There are 20 models and variants available throughout a country-wide network of dealers who have factory trained staff, fully equipped workshops and comprehensive stock of parts and a computerized UK parts depot, no less, with two million parts. It's interesting how 1970s brochure photography looks very much like 1970s car magazine photography because they're limited by, well, the technical constraints of the cameras and the film of the day. That really is showing, but it does show the very nice lines of the car and how clean the dashboard is. It mentions the 1565cc engine, twin choke Weber carburetor, and develops 65 bhp with top speed well over 90 mph. It can cruise comfortably all day at motorway speeds without undue sacrifice of fuel economy. Wow. The Renault 16 TL, a lounge on wheels. An accommodating car. It shows all the, <laughs> now this is amazing. It shows all the positions of the seats. Fully reclined, saloon car luggage, holiday luggage with the seats moved forward in the back. Rally resting position. So I guess if you're on a rally and need to sleep in the car, extra bulky luggage with everything pushed forward. But this is the one that really gets me. The playpen position, where it was considered not only acceptable, but recommended that you can put a playpen in the boot with your kid in a playpen when you're driving around. That is incredible. The 1970s was a different place. Oh, here we got the, ninth, the 16 TS with the uh, sporty dials. Yeah, and they love to show all the different seat variations in the 70s brochures. Wouldn't you love to see a motorway that deserted these days? And the TX with its alloy wheels. You getting that in shot? Yeah. Lovely. That's cool. What else we've got now? Nissan Prairie. Now, you do not see Nissan Prairies at all anymore. They were never enormously common, but they were common enough to see them pretty much around and about most places you could run into one. The world's first multi-purpose car. For most family motorists, the car has to perform a wide variety of roles from commuter to school bus, local town shop to holiday hold all. The first truly multi-purpose car. And it really was a full on MPV. I'm not sure what year that this came out. Bear in mind, this is designed and printed by Datsun UK at Worthing. Didn't know they're in Worthing. 
West Sussex. And your Datsun dealer, so this does date it quite a long time ago. Um, rear window winders fold away when not in use. That's quite cool. Five speed gearbox with overdrive ratio on fourth and fifth. That makes it a seven speed gearbox if that's the way that's worded. Equipped for every social occasion. The beach, or not the beach. Designed and engineered for driver satisfaction. Yeah, I can't think what year the Prairie came out. I'll have to Google that in a second. There's the other Nissan Prairie brochure. It's quite curious. Uh, I, this one is slightly newer. This one's designed and printed by Nissan UK Limited at Worthing. So this is like a year or so later when Nissan had stopped being Datsun at all. The thing you notice there though is how American the hubcaps look, or the wheel trims if you're going to be picky, look on the Datsun one here compared to the later alloys. Those look like a real American style dog dish center cap on a steel wheel. Like a real early 80s kind of a look. Old car brochures did love a bit of water in the background, but then car photographers do because there's generally less stuff to get in the way. Wow. I love the red and blue stripes across the top of each page. That is such a 1980s thing. The 80s were brilliant. And it shows how you can convert the, uh, the car into a full bed, just skipping it. Brilliant. Ideal for the horsey people in your life. Wow, I even call it a prairie after all. And finally, we've got the sleek, scorchy new Victor. Didn't know it was scorchy. Oh, I love the wording on the back here. What makes the Victor so sleek and scorchy? What makes the Victor go? Two engine sizes as follows. 97.5 cubic inch, 1590cc. It goes into the bore and stroke and everything. What makes the clutch so light? Diaphragm tight, but mechanically operated. What choice of transmissions? Three speed all synchro mesh with column change. What sort of final drive? Why is the suspension so good? Asked, said no one ever. Front suspension, long and short arms with coil springs, anti-roll bar connected to lower instruments. Did consumers really know what this meant back then, I wonder? The average sort of person going into a showroom would just wanted a car with comfy seats. Why is the steering so positive and safe? Rack and pinion bolted to the front subframe. What should I know about the brakes? What about the wheels and tyres? And the electrical system? And fuel? Will the Victor fit in my garage? <laughs> Can I personalise my Victor? Here are some of the tailored accessories available. Radio, aerial, wing mirrors. Radio, aerial and mirrors were accessories in 1970-whatever. Oh, 67, sorry. Um, rear seat belts, bumper overriders, fog lamps, reversing lamps. Reversing lamp was no extra. Wow. Towing attachment, locking petrol cap. Lockable lid for the glove box, wow. The new Victor 2000 with a whole lot of power and hush plush elegance. They like making up words at Vauxhall, don't they? Road hugging coil suspension plus broad tread tyres keep her steady as she goes. 104 horses catapult her out front and power assisted brakes with disc front discs stop her fast and easy. Who wrote this? Who were they trying to appeal to? Because this is sort of proper you know, young hippie cool talk, but appealing to, well, quite a large ex semi-executive saloon. Someone who wishes they were younger than they were, perhaps. This is the inside of the Victor 2000, where you're pampered and protected, are safety styled, slim profile, individual front seats with individually styled rear seats, all in rich ambler, with wood grained fascia, thick carpets, and a host of built in Vauxhall safety features. Oh, look at that black vinyl, which looks like it's actually bright and colourful, but that's just the studio lights in the background. Oh, that mad pink studio backdrop. The great 68 symbol comes in two sleek versions, the new Vauxhall Victor 1599cc and the even scorchier Victor 2000 for top line luxury. Both are confident, self-assured. Both are confident, self-assured, like all the Vauxhall breed. Hmm. Both have new overhead camshaft engines, both have all coil suspension for a smoother, sure ride. Very scorchy indeed. <laughs> Thank you, Daniel, those are brilliant. I'll add them to the brochure collection and keep them safe. Thank you very much indeed. Right, let's see what else is lurking in the treats from the seats. 
Right now, this one has come all the way from the US of A, where IN, I think, is Indiana, isn't it? So this has, well, it's winged halfway around the world. And let's see what's lurking inside. Now, where's it come from? The town is a gentleman called Peter. Peter, hello, thank you for sending this over. Appreciate it. Somewhere in Laporte, Indiana. Oh, it's a number plate, or a license plate. We like a license plate. Let's try and get through. He's packaged it nicely. It's bubble wrapped inside a bubble envelope, so protected on its flight around the world. So we've got Laporte, Indiana. I guessed right. That's an older one. Oh, they're both aluminium. 2014, I think, 2014 or 2013? Yeah, 2013 into 2014. And we haven't got a curious little slogan. Normally these are US license plates have some kind of slogan, land of whatever. This one has just got a, is that an Olympic torch on there? Did it, uh, Indiana have some kind of big games going on back in 2013, 14? And also this one has got, oh, a, a covered bridge. I love a covered bridge. We don't have them over here in this country at all, but such a staple of certain parts of America. Okay, this is 0614, which is uh, June 2014, but also 21. So is that 20? Oh, I'm confused now. But also it's 0614, but it's 13. So that, is that 0614 a, a district and then the year is in the sticker on the top? I don't know. Is there, there's a letter, maybe that will explain things. I should just read the letter, shouldn't I? Hi Matt, I've enjoyed your channel for years. Keep up the good work. Unfortunately, Indiana plates are not very exciting, but nevertheless, here you go for your wall collection. Best Pete. Thank you, Pete. I really do appreciate that. That's great. So, well, that's really cool because um, we started doing the collection over here and obviously ran out of wall and moved over to the barn where we've got more wall. And now we're trying to do every state in the USA and then try and get every country in the world. And where there's other countries like Australia, get all of the states. I need to have a quick recap on what I've got over there because people have asked me recently, have I got certain ones from Australia and New Zealand and that kind of thing. And I'm not sure if I have or not. I need to go and do a quick double check. Those are so cool. The thing is in the UK, have I got one around here? They're all the same. Wherever you are in the UK, they're the same. They're white on the front, yellow on the back, same font for whatever decade you're in. They change every, every sort of 30 years or so. And um, yeah, all you know is that the first couple of letters in the current system tells you where the car is registered. The second two tell you the half of the year and the year itself they're registered you don't get interesting pictures and colors and stuff and they stay with the car for the life of the car so they only come off when you update it normally when a car dealer sells it and puts their own logo on there so that's brilliant we love a bit of uh oh so we i think we all are quite fond of the license plates can i we'll put them both up there can we see them both yeah i think we can no we can't we can almost see them both Yeah, that'll do. Got some background going on now. Right, now, that's cool. We love a license plate on this channel. We're gonna have an entire wall of them covering the entire thing from front to back. Now, let's see what else is lurking in the seat. Now, this one, ooh, this is part Avion, so airmail, also NZ Post. So funny, I should mention New Zealand a second ago, because this is not planned in any way. You know I don't plan that far ahead, not even seconds ahead. Um, this has come all the way from Nigel. Nigel, who's in, uh, Wangarai, which is in New Zealand. Fantastic, so let's see what Nigel has sent over. Thank you, Nigel, for making the effort to do this. It literally is the other side of the world. So we've pulled some brooches and things. Oh, I'm seeing green stuff. Oh, it's Land Rover and Rover stuff, but from New Zealand. I wonder if it's different at all. Oh my word, this is great. So we've got today's cars from 1993-94. I have got a couple of 1993-94 Rovers. Rover 200 Coupe brochure. I have got a Rover Coupe. Rover 2000 SCTC and SC Automatic brochure. I have got a Rover 2000 SC. And 50 year Land Rover Collector's Edition bro Oh my goodness. We'll give this a couple of minutes to run through. Right. Hi, right, dear Matt, thank you for your brilliant channel. I look forward to seeing your content every week. Um, I came across your channel through Hubnut. I hosted here, we're in Wangarai for a couple of days um, in New Zealand trip a couple of years ago. Ah, okay, so if you check out the Hubnut New Zealand trips from 20, beginning of 2020, end of 2019, it was literally just before COVID happened. He was really lucky to get on a plane home again, just in the nick of time. Um, you might be able to see Nigel on one of those videos in, in Wangarai. These have enclosed a few brochures I've acquired over the years, which I think are relevant to your fleet. They are spot on for this fleet. 
the Range Rover brochure I got when I was choosing my next company car in the early 90s, the Rover P6 brochure I think I got in fitted the motor show in the NEC in 1975 with a 10 year old. Wow, so it's been over here taken all the way home and then it's come all the way back again. So this is the most well-traveled brochure on the planet. <laughs> Freeland brochures from 1998. We remember my wife bought a 50th anniversary special edition. I had the paint that changed colour from blue to green depending. Oh yeah, that's really cool that. Uh, it had a light quarter and loaded with accessories including a 12 volt electric cool hotbox. Wow. Oh, I'm very sorry to hear. He actually uh, sadly lost his wife shortly after buying it, which I'm really, really sorry to hear. Sorry, Nigel. Really looking forward to seeing the restoration of the Mini. The only classic Mini I have driven was an automatic one, supplied by to my grandfather under my mobility scheme. I still hope it's fun, that's good to know. So let's have a look at this stuff and see what we've got. So first of all, oldest first in this case, the Rover at the front, a lovely uh, paprika orange, which is a the best colour on a P6, but you never ever see them at all. Rover Triumph British Leyland, Solly Hull Warwickshire. Is there a year on this one printed on it? 1975, I think. Fairly late. Yeah, it did say Motor Show in 1975. Yeah, your executive, your architect, busy, important people. 2200 TC. In fact, the 2200 TC is, in my opinion, the best P6 because it's got a virtual performance of the V8, but better handling and a more rev happy engine and better economy. The 2200 engine conforms to the stringent, stringent exhaust emission standards now in force in many countries and therefore runs at a low level of atmospheric pollution. That's a funny thing to read sort of 50 odd years ago. Synchromesh gearbox, gearbox and all forward speeds on SC and TC models. On the SC automatic transmission is by a Type 35 Borg, Water, Borg Warner unit, which is absolutely dreadful. Which I, <laughs> they're awful gearboxes. And this. This, anyone designing a touch screen with basic car controls hidden under a menu needs to look at these controls here in the P6. They are the pinnacle of car controls. Even with the lights off, you know exactly what each one does because they're all different shapes and they're laid out in such a way that you don't need to see them. You just find them by touch without taking your eyes off the road. Ultimate safety. Rover knew what they were doing. They're a brilliant company. Oh, look at that, that's a beautiful car, it really is. I've got all the interior dimensions, exterior dimensions, a brilliant, brilliant thing. Ah, high speed testing, I guess probably at Myra. So let's have a look at this, the 200 brochure. It's opening up the new Rover 200 Coupe, Rover's sporting heritage projected into the 1990s, creating a car of unique style, prestige and power. You can tell it's an early one because it hasn't got a grill. It's got the clean, un, un, ungrilled bonnet. <laughs> which a lot of people do prefer actually, just a little slot in the front with a little lower trim piece underneath. So if you're going to do a trim delete, you do need to find that lower piece. Tahiti blue is such a good color on these cars. It, looks, it just shows the shape so perfectly. The curves, the, the swoops, the shapes, it's lovely. Oh, in fact, she says, the purpose is unmistakable. The lithe curving contours, the sporting stance. Although by modern standards, that is basically on stilts. <laughs> Few experiences on earth can prepare you for the startling acceleration and equally amazing quietness of the 200 PS turbocharged Rover engine. It was blisteringly quick. I mean, it was right up there with things like the um, the uh, RS Escort, what do you call it, the Cosworth, sorry. It would show a clean pair of heels to pretty much anything. All the times you felt driving should give you something more, this is the car you're looking for. They are great to drive. In all fairness, the R8s are brilliant to drive and the coupes are even better. The cabin of the Rover Coupe reflects Rover's traditional design excellence, blending good ergonomics with sporting luxury. It's a nice place to be, in fairness. Oh, that brilliant Targa top, is, that is a fun, fun thing to be driving around with. Pop the top out and you're in a convertible all of a sudden, it's great. Levels of grip are uncanny. Mm, well, they're good. <laughs> Yeah, lots of accessories, lots of high points. This was fully loaded by 1990s standards. Uh, it's interesting, this is an early 90s brochure with the early face that didn't actually last that long. So my car was a 93, and um, it was kind of on the crossover time when they started adding it. My car was one that was probably a, a non grill car, and because it was a dealer demonstrator, I think had the grill added to it while it was still a demonstrator by the dealership. So that's really cool. And then we have the 93, 90, no, November 93 to March 94, complete range. So we've got everything here. So 
So a quick run through, we've got, apart from the, the bump at the beginning, Rover's Commitment Selection Spotlight, the 800, the 600, the 400, the 200, the Metro, then we've got the old school stuff, the Montego Estate, because they never must, initially they didn't have an R8 Estate car, so the Montego had to soldier on long after its sell by date. Maestro Saloon and Van, well I kept it going for the van basically, but I guess it was a very cheap entry level car at that point. Um, and of course the Mini, the Mini was still a thing that was on sale at this point. So Rover Commitment, Rover Select, which is the aftercare stuff, Rover News. This is quite a cool um, heavy duty thing they've put out, given away in the, in the dealership. This is, I don't know how many pages are in there. It's about a hundred pages nearly. Oh, Rover Sport, they just landed straight back on the, uh, <laughs> what a juxtaposition, got the 200 coupe doing motorsport and competition and then a 600 doing a caravan which is the absolute opposite of that whole ethos. So more Rover news, 800 series showing all the luxury, the wood, all that kind of stuff and the full specification and it's a lot of detail in here I mean, you find every single thing about these cars the 600 series likewise this was sort of punching high in the luxury stakes trying to steal people from the you know the sierra and the cavalier kind of buyer with a bit more luxury and something the 400 which is basically a 200 with a boot but it didn't at this point have the uh, estate i don't think and the R8 was every conceivable um, body shape. Three door, five door hatch, convertible estate, four door saloon. Yeah, it was a interesting market position for the 400 because it was a bit smaller than the other cars it was competing with, like the Sierra, but it was much more comfortable. And the 200, which is, well, in five door form, virtually a 400, but with a, looking less posh, but being far more practical. Still got bits of Honda in it at this point. And the Metro soldiering on sort of 12 years after its launch at this point. Montego Estates, wow. All the, because there's no big, there was no big estate car in the Rover range apart from that one at this time. Room, Maestro, roomy, economical, superb value for money. And the Maestro van, these are proper rocking horse material now because you just do not see a Maestro van anywhere. Bit of a niche loving thing. The Mini, I mean they've chosen the least tasteful Mini possible for the brochure shot. The body kitted convertible, very very of its time I have to say. I mean how old was the Mini in 1993, sort of 59 to, yeah, 1959 to 1993, it's a lot of years. Under the bonnet of the Sprite and the Mayfair is the 1275cc Mini engine, so it's still the A-series, not even the K-series version at this point. Wow. All familiar hallmarks are there. The bonnet stripes match the roof colour, the front auxiliary driving lamps, sports alloy wheels and low-profile tyres giving an edge to the road holding and outmaneuvered far larger, more powerful cars on the circuit. Yeah, that is the, the thing with those. They are so much fun. The customer and the rover, safety, security, environment, heritage. Oh gosh, Gaiden. I think Gaiden had only just opened at that point. Was brand new wasn't it that is such a cool brochure there's everything rover in a nutshell in the early 90s that's brilliant and finally 50th anniversary collector's edition oh so we've got lots of stuff typical you know it's land rover it's in the green folder land rover very much about the outdoors of course so this is all the freelander stuff and i'm curious to see what they've done about pricing in here Oh, it's only pounds. Okay, so it's come from New Zealand, but the price list and accessory list, sorry, is all in, in sterling. There's a lot of stuff you can bung on your Freeland. I mean, there's like, the wine list here is three long pages long of all kinds of different stuff you can add to your Freelander. And I, thought, I do kind of like the accessory brochure best of all. The Freelander is comfortable anywhere. Busy city streets or half off-road off terrain are easily dealt with in safety, comfort and style. It's rugged adaptability is legendary power to performance to, and uh, it's rugged, it, it doesn't make sense. It's rugged adaptability is legendary power and performance to match. There should be a comma in there. It's hard to beat. To enhance an already outstanding vehicle and add your individual touch, Land Rover produced purpose-designed accessories. And there are loads of them. 
tow bars, side things, styling stuff, different wheels, roof bars, rugged practicality. It's oh, so much stuff. Lighting wheels, protection bars, rock sliders, roof rack. I mean, as you know, we've got the um, roof tent on ours. And the next thing to do is going to be stick a, a tow bar on it so we can take bikes with us on holiday trips or we'll tow stuff around. Interior protection. Yeah, I've got the boot mat in mine, which is really handy for. We've been carrying cement and sand, but making a new shed base. So much cool stuff. Oh, I'd love a three door. You get the three door, which you lift off, and you get the uh, weather cover if you've gone out and parked somewhere. That's really cool. So, 50 years of Land Rover. So, this is what, 19. Is it 1949 the first one to 1999 this would be? Freelander Collector's Edition. So this is the the three the five door, the three door hardback, the three door softback, all the different versions. Pure escapism and why not? I did have the three door hardback back when they came out into one when they were newish in 2002. And I absolutely loved it. That was a great looking car. I actually really like a three door again. There's such cool looking things. All different options and this is the pre-2000 there was a minor facelift around 2001 i think and they sorted out a lot of issues the one thing i didn't saw oh, that's something i'm halfway through collecting is the light bars i've got the front light bars but i haven't got the rear light bars yet um so i do need to sort that out the interiors on the first ones were um just mad colors i'm hoping there's a picture of the interior in here Okay, this is 50 years range. So at this point, 1999, we've got the Freelander hiding in the dark at the back of the studio shot. Got the Defender, got the Range Rover P38, and got the original um, Discovery, which suddenly looks very, very old fashioned indeed in the, the pre facelift guys before the Mark II. So this is the, the family look they've given to the brochure. All these little tiny photos showing the different options. What is curious is that the gear shift is going automatic in the Defender and a 4 litre V8, which must have been a real special edition because you didn't get them in almost any, certainly none in the UK, or virtually none in the UK, I should say. Discovery, and Series 1 Discoveries, I think, are a good future classic or current classic collector's car. P38, Vogue 5.0, the 5 litre V8. The P38 is a great car, very comfortable, very capable. Really nice. However, you need to be a glutton for punishment or an absolute enthusiast to own one. Oh, check out these colours. So this is the Atlantis blue you mentioned in the letter, which does actually kind of shimmer and change colour as you move it through the light. Beautiful. So this would have been a custom printed brochure for this particular customer. That's really cool. And finally, this is the quote for, actually from, from Cumbria, this was in Britain, in British currency. It's for a 1999 Freelander 50th anniversary hardback and including £315 for front fog lamps was... Oh, it didn't actually have a price on it. It just shows all the spec. Lots of spec though. <laughs> Permanent four-wheel drive. Under convenience. Right, we've got one more thing to open and that is this absolutely enormous bucket which I was lucky I didn't take the bicycle down to go and collect it because I wouldn't have got anywhere with it. This is going to take some opening. Right, now you might notice a slight continuity jump at this point because when I was opening that last giant packet, I hadn't realised that the little button on the microphone here had been nudged and that mutes everything. So everything I just recorded over the course of quite a few minutes is now useless. So in the background, you can, or in the foreground possibly, you can see lots of stuff of me unwrapping this massive parcel, which I have to admit, when it arrived, I did think was actually a door card for a Rover 75. Although someone saw my struggles with the, uh, the fabric trim on the passenger door of the 75 and took pity on me and they sent me a new door car through but they hadn't what well, they sent me through it was rover related the bulk of that package was in fact a parcel shelf from a 200 which is a useful thing to own but should i get another 200 that hasn't got a parcel shelf in it um that will certainly come in very handy however it's not a rover 75 door card so that was slightly off-putting because there's a bunch of other stuff in there which i'll quickly show you um I did unbox it already and, and talk through it once already. First of all, we've got also from Rover 25, we've got a book pack. So service manual, handbooks, a book pack is always a useful thing to have. It kind of completes the package. When I got my 200 VI, that didn't come with the books. So I actually had to buy a correct period 200 VI manual. And that's quite an expensive one because it's in a lovely brown leather um, folder, which looks beautiful. Um, but yeah, it wasn't the cheapest thing in the world. But this one has all the 
the 25 era car, owner's handbook, and service history. So I can tell you this particular car was a 25 1.4 Spirit 5 door, registered on the 21st of July 2002. Uh, down in Western Supermare, Western Supermare, to quote Bottom from many years ago, and it was serviced by Rover right up until uh, 2004, by which point it had done nine and a half thousand miles. I imagine it's no longer around. Secondly, there was a BMW um, thing, a slightly softer, more more fancy with it's gonna be mw it's gonna be much more fancy sort of soft touch fabric thing from a car that was bought in ocean bmw down in Painton in devon and this car i worked out from the service book that this is another complete um you know book pack so if i ever get one of these cars i've got something to put in the glove box and complete the look this one was a uh where was the this one was a 3 Series, I think. Um, this was a through and night eye SE automatic on an X-Reg, which is 2001. So January, 2nd of January 2001. So someone must have ordered that over Christmas, perhaps, or to be delivered at Christmas. And it was serviced by Ocean BMW for quite a while. Um, but looking at the picture, that is, I believe, from memory, E46, look at those headlights. I think it is E46, isn't it? Which is a really nice era of BMW, as to be said. And finally, in terms of book packs, there was a Fiat one, and I was very excited when I saw that because my Punto, my, my very early Punto, didn't come with a book pack. It was, in fact, though, for, oh, I can't get this out, for quite a snug fit, a Multipla, which the car would actually quite like to have. I do like the Multipla, it's deliciously weird. Um, so all the intricacies of using a multiple should I ever come across one of those because if I do come across one it will certainly be a cheap one that needs fixing all it's all in there and this one I, it was a bit late actually this book pack for my um my, my punto because mine's a 94 which is the very earliest of puntos this is or was I should say PDI'd on the 28th of May 2008 so where was this done in Port Bream Bristol then moved up to, to Telford in Shropshire. So about 15 years newer than my Punto, but it's still a Fiat book pack, and so I can leave this in the car and pretend I've got a, uh, a relevant book pack. Now then, where else? There was a couple other things in there, but also in that same packet, making the thing feel like it was a door card, um, a couple of uh, handbooks, got a Mondeo, and uh, Datsun Cherry. The Mondeo I had last Christmas, absolutely loved, really enjoyed the car. There's a strong possibility I might get another one of those because they are an awful lot of fun, really enjoyed that. So that could certainly come in handy because I was blind, going in blind on that one. And Datsun Cherry, I mean, God. I would say it's more likely that there are more Datsun Cherry Haynes manuals in circulation than there are Datsun Cherries in existence. So that is <laughs> something that may or may not come in handy, but you never know. Finally, and it's because I did this a day or so ago and I initially recorded it, I'm pretty sure this Gillingham Rover number plate from 2003 also came in that pack, which is quite cool because from the number plate wall, but this one, not only is it local to me, I'm in Kent, Gillingham's in Kent, that's just up the road, um, it's a Rover. So very cool indeed. I actually sell stickers with that little Rover logo from the 90s and early noughties on it. If you head over to um, the Furious Driving Red Bubble store, and I've actually got them in person as well. So if you've seen me at a show, I've not put them onto the main website yet. I will do it at some point when I've got more time. And there's one more thing, one more thing, sir, as they say, to quote Colombo, which wasn't sent in to me. I did pay for it because it was a little bit of money, but I saw it on eBay and I watched it until the end of the auction. Then I made a cheeky offer and I had to have it because it's the same size as my Alfa Romeo sign on the wall behind you. And I've not long bought the, uh, the Punto and that is the perfect accompaniment for the Fiat Punto and the Alfa Romeo sign. There's also a Rover sign over there. I love these car dealer signs of, of yesteryear. This is actually fairly current actually with this particular font. Um, this is actually the font I've started using on the uh, thumbnails at the moment, um, which is the, the Fiat font. So, uh, right, so thank you very much indeed for being part of this, if you've sent stuff in, for watching if you haven't. If you've got stuff you want to send in, then do fire over to me here at Furious Driving. PO Box 477 Aylesford, Kent, ME 69 LE. You'd think I'd remember that by now. Anything gratefully received because it's amusing to share with the class. We all enjoy this kind of stuff. So if you've got it, bung it over and uh, we'll all have a, 
a good laugh together, hopefully. Anyway, thank you for watching. See you again very soon, hopefully either in person on a video at a show. If you haven't subscribed to this channel as well as the main channel, then please do hit the button down below because that's really, really nice indeed. And then you'll see the next one of these. Anyway, thank you for watching. I'll see you again very soon. Goodbye.